The story you've heard about Venus is that early on in its history, something went catastrophically wrong. Its plate tectonics like never existed or shut down, and it switched into this runaway greenhouse effect. And we see the Venus that we have today with enormous surface temperature, pressure, it's no place for a human being to walk around. But a new paper suggests that in fact, Venus did have plate tectonics at the same time that the Earth had plate tectonics and had them for a while before something shut them down. And we got this sort of stagnant lid planet that we have today. And if that's the case, then there were like two worlds in the solar system that had plate tectonics for long periods of time, places that could have had life. And think about the implications for other planets out there across the Milky Way. My guest today is Dr. Matt Weller. He's the lead researcher on this paper and talks about the evidence that he thinks indicates that yes, Venus did have plate tectonics for a long time. We talk about this as well as like what implications this has for the future of our exploration of exoplanets and finding plate tectonics out there across the universe. All right, enjoy this conversation with Dr. Matt Weller. Matt, how awful subjectively is Venus? Or maybe objectively, how awful is the place? <laughs> well, I think that depends on um, your perspective. Um, if you are us and standing at the surface, it would be very awful for about a fraction of a second. <laughs> and then we wouldn't really care that much anymore. Very awful be, uh, for the rest of your somewhere. life. Yeah. <laughs> the uh, surface, very awful. Yeah. Uh, the surface pressures are substantially higher than the earth. We're talking approximately 93 times earth pressure. So that's bottom of the ocean. Uh, surface temperature is hot enough to melt lead. Uh, it would be a very, very bad place for us to be uh, as people. But when we're sitting here on the Earth observing Venus, it's a wonderful place. Uh, we can see that we have really two similar planets uh, in terms of where they were uh, formed in the solar neighborhood, the material they were formed with, but we have planets that are completely separate and different from each other. And being able to ask why that is makes Venus a wonderful place and a wonderful right, test case in our solar system. Pushing it into the sun for a little bit so we can we understand it better. <laughs> um, so, I mean, like, obviously, the that big difference is that you've got this enormous you know, this high pressure atmosphere, you 92 times Earth's pressure at the surface, it's as if you're a kilometer below the ocean. Uh, the temperatures mm -hmm. are, as you say, hot enough to melt lead across the entire planet. Why is it so different from Earth? Hmm. That I think is the million dollar question. Uh, one of the reasons that people suspect is it lacked plate tectonics. That's been kind of that canonical view. And the reason people uh, thought this was if you actually took all of uh, the carbonate rocks on the earth, stuff that sequesters CO2 from our own planet, and suddenly released all that CO2, melted it, uh, and put it into the atmosphere, you would have something that looked very, very similar to Venus. So the argument's really been that Venus didn't necessarily have plate tectonics, uh, in part because the atmosphere was so thick uh, that you never actually kicked in this carbonate silicate weathering cycle that pulled CO2 out. Um, that's kind of the canonical way of viewing it. Uh, obviously, for this paper, we took a very different approach and actually said that um, the atmosphere in and of itself is indicative of this early plate tectonic-like regime, and that actually what you're seeing for Venus today is not necessarily due to the planets fundamentally being different in their early tectonics, but something else pushed them apart. Uh, and that could be increasing surface temperatures, for example. Uh, that could shut down plate tectonics. Uh, so Venus closer to the sun, losing water, you actually resist um, the driving forces that cause plate tectonics, and you can move into a different type of regime where you actually kind of cook yourself. And that's what we argue is very likely to have happened. Well, with, uh, when Venus. did plate tectonics get started on Earth? Huh. Depends on who you ask. Depends on um, what data set. 
uh, you're looking at. So it's been suggested that v- uh, sorry, Earth has been in a plate tectonic regime pretty much its entire evolution. Uh, there have been people and data sets that have challenged this idea, uh, specifically through paleomagnetic records, where we actually don't seem to see uh, the surface moving a lot. Uh, and there's actually a recent paper that came out that suggested from this paleomagnetic record that the Earth did not initiate plate tectonics until some point after 3.7 billion years ago, which suggests early Earth was in another style but of But there was life regime. on Earth then. Yeah. There was life, yes. Yes. Um, and that, that is one of those fundamental questions that we're looking at. So – we look at life and we say, well, there's life on the earth. We don't really see it anywhere else in the solar system. There's no concrete evidence for it anywhere else. And the earth has plate tectonics. Therefore, life is required. Uh, well, life requires plate tectonics. Uh, that might not actually be the case. Uh, life could be independent of plate tectonics, uh, at least initially. Now, Having long-term habitability, long-term life might actually require plate tectonics and this long-term volatile cycling that happens. Uh, that carbon silicate weathering cycle, bringing material into the interior, re-releasing it. Uh, that might be needed to keep a stable atmosphere, climate conditions, liquid water at the surface over, say, four and a half billion years, but maybe not over the first And billion. so then – what you know what what are you thinking or what are you finding for when plate tectonics got started going on venus hmm. so one of the interesting things about uh the study we just did is that uh venus really kind of requires this very very early phase of plate tectonics to release enough nitrogen into the atmosphere that we see for observations on Venus. Uh, Venus is weird in that it has three and a half times roughly the nitrogen that the Earth has at the surface in the atmosphere. And the question is, how do you get that? And the reality is you get it through extreme outgassing. And you can do that through very, very early plate tectonics. So the key difference here for Venus and Earth could very well be that Venus actually initiated in a plate tectonic regime, sat there for a, maybe a billion years when the Earth pops into plate tectonics, and then Venus quickly shuts down after that. That's always an interesting fact that I will throw at people where you'll I'll say like, when you think about how most of the Earth's atmosphere is nitrogen, Venus has three times as much, and they're shocked. Like they know about the carbon dioxide, but they don't know about the <laughs> nitrogen. And in fact, triple the nitrogen, but also an insane amount more carbon dioxide to overwhelm that. Um, yes. So, I guess can we? So that. So I guess the evidence rests on this formation of the nitrogen in the atmosphere of Venus that was produced by the plate tectonics, the outgassing early on. Are there mm -hmm. other gases in the atmosphere that could indicate plate tectonics in early Venus? Hmm. That's a really good question. Uh, so one gas is actually argon. Uh, argon, uh, radiogenic argon particularly, is released as it decays in the interior. So when it builds up in the atmosphere, you're building up through this melting process. So classically, uh, Venus has been argued to not be terribly degassed relative to the Earth because of uh, the low levels of argon in Venus's atmosphere. Uh, the issue with that for Venus is that the non-radiogenic argon, which is also a trace indicator of kind of long-term evolution of a planet, is substantially larger in volume and mass in the Venusian atmosphere. So that's saying that Venus is actually really, really outgassed relative to the Earth, maybe even more so than the Earth. Uh, so those are kind of your classic examples of um, gases that we look for for plate tectonics. Uh, well, nitrogen's a new one that we've suggested, but in the past, argon has been the principal uh, idea of, uh, to trace the long-term evolution in outgassing. Um, in terms of other specific gases, uh, there aren't that many that we think are truly indicative of plate tectonics. They're more indicative of perhaps life. Um, 
So uh, oxygen in the atmosphere um, can be produced biotically or even abiotically. Methane is similar as well. So those are signatures we would look for life, but we don't really see that per se in uh, plate tectonic versus not plate tectonic regimes. But would that also explain the carbon dioxide that you just had outgassing that just kept going on and then shut mm -hmm. down? Yeah, I mean, that that's kind of the key takeaway that uh, this early phase of plate tectonics is effectively a runaway plate tectonic state. Uh, we have buffers that feed back and um, will stabilize our atmosphere and climate, and that could be life, potentially. Uh, but in Venus, it looks like that did not happen. Uh, so Venus is this runaway state where Earth didn't hmm. ever hit that runaway state. Oh, that's really interesting. So then I guess... Tell the story of Venus then, just sort of in terms of the of the emergence of this plate tectonics, and then sort of when it shut down and what we see today. It's like, how do you are you sort of recreating the history of the planet now? Hmm. So, one of the interesting things about Venus is the surface is at most um, well, it ranges in estimates, but it's roughly seven hundred million years old by crater counting estimates. So this means that when we look at the surface of Venus, we don't see uh, much, if necessarily anything, that's older than about 700 million years. So we can't see Venus's past. Beyond that point in time, we are completely blind. Uh, we don't know what the Venusian past looks like. We don't know what its evolution looks like. And that's been one of the driving factors for why Venus has been so interesting. Uh, because we don't, unlike the Earth, where we have old rocks at the surface, unlike Mars, the Moon, which are all old, Venus is very, very young. So what this kind of does is we've had these competing ideas that has Venus been like Mars, stagnant lived its entire evolution, has it been, uh, as it had this early phase of plate tectonics, has it been something else? So what we actually were able to do is we use the atmosphere to x-ray the interior to actually look at what the evolution of Venus had to be. And in that case, we actually have that very early Venus entering this very early plate tectonic-like state, cooking itself early on, uh, which could take a billion or a couple billion years before coming what we see today. So when we look at Venus, we really aren't seeing the past, but we are in the sense that the atmosphere actually can x-ray the interior of the planet. And and like I know the with that stagnant lid hypothesis that instead of having the plate tectonics, the, just the surface turned itself inside out every few hundred million, billion years or so, in this sort of catastrophic event. Is that still like, do we get like plate tectonics in the beginning and then that shut down and switched over to this more stagnant lid method? So that's a really good question. Um, so it turns out, uh, and this is work that I've been doing for years uh, with much more um, advanced dynamic models. Uh, when you actually move out of a plate tectonic regime or move into a plate tectonic regime for that matter, the system, and the system in this case is the interior mantle and lithosphere that we're looking at, effectively becomes unstable. So you have massive amounts of material that will suddenly break at the surface, be drawn into the interior material, will rise up to replace it and melt. And the uh, idea of those older models, the catastrophic events. So that's something that typically is called an episodic lid. Uh, but usually it's, at least from what I've been finding with my work, it's, it's more of a transitional regime. So when you shut down plate tectonics, you go into this kind of extreme oscillatory behavior. So shutting down plate tectonics and this catastrophic overturning model are effectively um, intertwined for Venus. So it might take, uh, when you shut down the system, it's not automatic because it takes time for that signal to reach the uh, interior from the surface, and that can take billions of years. So you create a system where plate tectonics starts to slow and shut down, your planet is effectively becoming unstable, and you can oscillate for a few billion years. And if you were to look in between the, these oscillations of these extreme events, you would see something like Venus today. You would see a surface that's not really doing much. There's somewhat limited volcanism evidence for currently. 
uh, even though there's a lot of resurfacing, obviously, which is volcanic. Uh, but you wouldn't see a lot of activity at any point in time until it becomes unstable and goes again. I mean, we look at Mars, and it's vastly smaller, less massive than Earth and Venus, and it has that stagnant lid. And it's just because it's small, and it cooled down, and it's farther from the sun. But Venus is big, and is getting more energy coming from the sun even than Earth does. And so it seems weird that it would shut down its plate tectonics. So have you got a sense of just like what f finally shut it down? Or will the plate tectonics return in the future? Also a great question. So one of the things that can happen, uh, it turns out that plate tectonics, these dynamic systems are very sensitive to what's happening at the surface. And this can be surface temperature. So if you crank up your surface temperature high enough, uh, what really, you, you have kind of competing effects that you actually have um, recrystallization of the surface that fractures aren't, they don't quite form the same way. Uh, the material is a little bit weaker and uh, you can actually um, not allow stable through going faults to occur. And then you have dynamic recrystallization. That is where the, the pulse will heal. Uh, so you have these kind of competing effects. But what the takeaway is you crank up that surface temperature, you cook the surface of the planet, and that creates a feedback that can actually shut down plate tectonics. Uh, and that's because the planet is a large heat engine. Uh, and what's driving that is really the temperature difference from the surface to just the base of the lithosphere. And that can be a thousand Kelvin. That could be a, a big whopping signature. Uh, so for the Earth, that's something like 200 Kelvin to 260 Kelvin to something like 13, 14, 1500, depending on what where you're looking at. On Venus, you know, that's almost a thousand Kelvin. But on Venus, that might be only 400. So you're actually reducing the energy available to drive plate tectonics. Hmm. Now, the sun is heating up very slowly. And in the next, say, 500 million to a billion years, the oceans will will boil away, and we will start to go into our version of a runaway greenhouse effect. Will we look like Venus then? Or do you think we'll still have plate tectonics, even though we're a lot less habitable? That really depends on a lot of factors that we don't have a great handle on currently but looking at i mean these are simplified models because you're trying to understand some of the base physics of the behavior uh looking at the simplified models the implication really is as goes venus so too does the earth that we are effectively looking at the long-term uh fate of the earth unless something dramatically changes and, and there are ways to slow down climate change, natural or otherwise. Um, for instance, there's a cloud albedo feedback that can kick in. So as you start kind of warming up the atmosphere, you start bringing more water vapor into it, which can form clouds, which can actually reflect more light. So you can actually have a feedback effect that'll keep the atmosphere much more clement than you would normally expect. But if it goes above a critical threshold, Yes, you will see very likely something similar to Venus today. And we right. might have two planets that are now identical again huh. in the future. So let's go back in time again now and sort of chart the habitability of Venus. When would you have the potential for liquid water on the surface and for how long? Hmm. So that is actually a very interesting question. Um, one of the kind of takeaways of this very early plate tectonic regime is that it generates atmosphere fast, generates very thick atmospheres in the order of 10 million years or less uh, for some of the models. So for Venus, uh, in order to have stable liquid water at the surface, you have to have uh, buffering kicking in. You have to have that silicate weathering cycle, maybe even life uh, modulating it. And it has to be established within the first couple million years. Otherwise, you very quickly move into this uh, runaway greenhouse state. If you have life doing that, or you have the silicate weathering cycle independent of life doing that, and it can keep up with the outgassing, uh, 
um, of the interior, you can potentially have a billion years, two billion years of habitability for Venus. Uh, but those are fundamentally things we don't know yet. Um, one of the ways to get to it is when we actually look at uh, the water loss history of Venus from upcoming missions. If we can measure uh, the deuterium to hydrogen ratio, we can tell when water was lost in Venus, which tells us a lot of its climate evolution. If it was found to be lost early, Venus probably hit its grand runaway greenhouse state almost immediately. If it's found much later, then there are very likely were stable water oceans uh, for a portion of Venusian history. But uh, what this means is if you go back a billion years, or go back to the first billion years of the solar system, and you were to look at Mars, Venus, and Earth, you might actually see three planets that had liquid water oceans simultaneously. Uh, and then they shortly thereafter, or some point thereafter, diverged and only the Earth remained habitable, where each of the planets had the potential to be. What would it take to learn more? About Venus's history? Yeah, just about, about what would it take to learn more about this early history of Venus? Better spacecraft, better observations, you know, measurements from the surface, mm -hmm. uh, you know, find... Mag, you know, magnetic rocks in mm -hmm. lava flows, things like that. Yeah. Uh, so finding magnetic rocks might be a problem uh, just because the surface is going to be pretty much above the Curie temperature. So you're not going to lock in remnant magnetization, unfortunately. Oh, really? I didn't yeah. know that. Okay. So you're yeah. not going to be able to get any it, it, magnetic history. It, there could be very select places um, for high up in the Montes, perhaps, where the temperatures are low enough. But generally speaking, uh, it would be unlikely to find that. But what we do want, what would actually be um, two things, are the biggest bang for the bucks. The first is looking at the noble gases. So having an and we're doing this with Da Vinci, uh, an atmospheric probe is going to be going down to the surface and it's going to be collecting data. Uh, so that's we're going to be looking at argon, um, neon, helium, um, hopefully looking at nitrogen as well. Uh, and we can determine a lot about the emplacement of the atmosphere that way. How much of it's primordial? How much of it came from formation? How much of it was outgas from the interior? This will go a long way to telling us what happened with Venus. The other thing we need, and there really isn't a way to escape this, um, we need a sample return. We need a mission that will actually go and collect rocks and bring them back so we can analyze them. Well, that sounds doable. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that, that's, a, that's a much longer <laughs> trajectory. I mean, um, not going to be in the next 10 years, but we could be working towards it. Um, and we probably should be, there are people who are thinking that in that direction, but it is technologically challenging currently. Yeah. Yeah. I've, I've looked into this a bit, like ideas of balloon missions that extend mm -hmm. a tether down and try to scoop a little bit of surface off, you know, off the, off the planet and then reel it back up before your bucket melts yeah. and then give it to a rocket. And then the rocket, mm -hmm. like it's bonkers yeah. to try and pull this off, but if we could get a piece of, of Venus, that would be amazing. Are there any Venus meteorites on Earth? I don't think so. <laughs> We've never identified them. Yeah. Uh, it, it's possible that they exist. Uh, they've not been identified in the catalog. Uh, just by law of averages, it's happened. Um, it, it's harder to get uh, an asteroid from Venus to the Earth in general. And it's hard to get material out through that atmosphere of Venus to begin with. Uh, so over billions of years, almost assuredly, as uh, meteorites have fallen, we just don't see them. We have our own selection and preservation bias. Most of the meteorites that fall, fall in the oceans. And then we never see them again, and they're subducted into the interior. So we are limited by what we have. Um, but yeah, they should exist. We just haven't oh, identified them. I mean, there's, I mean, there's, that's a whole other conversation about all of the meteorites that should, like, there should be interstellar meteorites, there should be meteorites from Venus, there should be meteorites from just all kinds of interesting places mm -hmm. over time, but they're just so, so hard to find. Mm -hmm. um, but I do like that idea of like finding them on the bottom of the ocean. I want, because I think about people going across Antarctica and you spot a rock in the top of the snow. Mm -hmm. 
if you saw a weird rock at the bottom of the ocean, could you say, oh, that's a meteorite? I wonder. It, it's a good question. Um, I mean, we you, the problem is you don't know if it's a fresh fall. Uh, you don't know its context. But there's an added complication with Venus. Uh, the evidence we do have from the Russian missions uh, looking at the surface spectroscopy is that Venus looks a lot like the Earth. It looks like effectively mid-ocean ridge uh, material. So if we did collect a sample from Venus, if we had this meteorite, we might not be able to distinguish it from the Earth, which is wow. one of the reasons why we need that sample return. We right. need actually something we know for a fact is from Venus to compare it. To be able to say, is this actually Earth-like, or is it really different? We just and don't it doesn't know. feel like salt water is the best place to store no. <laughs> your meteorite samples. No, they do tend to react. Yes. Yeah. Now, if true, this is gigantic because you've got two worlds in our solar system that had plate tectonics. What are the implications for extrasolar planets? <laughs> uh, that is actually how this particular study originally started. Uh, we were looking at habitability of uh, potential habitability throughout gassing of exoplanets. And just by happenstance, I looked at the nitrogen story, and that's what keyed me into looking at Venus. But if we look at our own solar system, uh, we really have two hypotheses. The Earth is unique or the Earth is common. Those are our two options. And we have a sample size of one, right? We look at the Earth. We have the Earth. We know it's in plate tectonic regime. We know it has life. Uh, and we just don't know when we look out in the uh, cosmos how likely Earth really is. But if we're looking at our own solar system with its own experiment, I mean, and we can look at Venus and Earth and view this as a laboratory experiment. The solar system gave us two planets that are very similar in principle to each other. And if we find that both of them had life, both of them had plate tectonics, uh, both of them had climate atmosphere allowing for liquid water, that would tell us that plate tectonics, liquid water uh, at the surface is perhaps much more common in the um, uh, universe than we would normally think. Uh, it, yeah, I wouldn't necessarily say default, but common. It would be more common. Um, and one of the reasons is that it uh, turns out uh, tectonic regimes can actually be uh, degenerate states, meaning you can get two different states for the exact same conditions just by small random chance. Uh, and, and that's another actual possibility to explain Venus and Earth. But if we do see in our own solar system, we have a case of two. It is strongly indicative that there are a lot more out there. It might be the preponderance. Now, can telescopes like James Webb be able to do any kind of spectroscopic analysis of exoplanets and see the same presence of, of nitrogen? Like, is there any way to confirm these, these observations out there in the wider universe? That, that would be one of the telltales, I would argue. Uh, I would argue, actually, you wouldn't necessarily even need the nitrogen per se. The nitrogen, if we could get that data, um, but it really depends on what proportion of the atmosphere it is. If it's a, for Venus, it's roughly 3, 4% of the atmosphere. That's not large. CO2 is going to dominate any signal there. Um, but I would actually argue, if you're looking for plate tectonics, um, the story for Venus and the Earth might actually be telling us that if you see these really, really thick atmospheres, particularly in young planetary systems, um, some hundred million billion years after their formation, that that is actually telling us that those were early plate tectonic planets. Uh, what about those noble gases, hmm. though? Like, is that the way? Uh, noble gases are much more difficult, from my understanding, to be able to detect um, from James Webb or other missions. Uh, I don't believe we have the sensitivity or enough. We, I think these might be a few generations ahead, uh, where yeah, we, we right. need to move a few generations ahead in detection uh, capabilities. But yes, if we could uh, detect these noble gases, uh, that would tell us a lot. Uh, but for instance, uh, we can't actually use space-based observations uh, to detect 
noble gases throughout the atmosphere of Venus today. We need a mission to do it. <laughs> so right. we might actually still and need missions. And it's right missions. over there. Yes. Yeah, we, we might still need missions to physically go to uh, another planet to be able to tell its specific history. So we, we probably need to be looking at planets kind of much more holistically, the generation of the atmosphere, where it's sitting in the stellar neighborhood, um, things like that to be able to infer, uh, not necessarily if it d uh, d definitively is in a plate tectonic regime, but maybe a probability of it, that these are much more likely candidates to be in a plate tectonic regime, for instance. If if Earth isn't normal, or sorry, if you know, if if Earth is is average, if Earth is just a totally normal planet, and we can see that the plate tectonics that happened on Earth happened over on Venus, what I mean, how do you feel about the implications for the search for life in the universe? Well, that opens up a whole new can of worms. <laughs> uh, so we have a very open question on whether or not uh, life needs plate tectonics. Uh, so again, we, we look at the earth and that's a sample size of one. We need that other data point. So Venus might've had plate tectonics, but there's no guarantee it had life. And that could actually be one of the key differences too, that life ameliorated the atmosphere, uh, made plate tectonics easier to happen once it did or continue to proceed. Uh, cause there is, there are cases that have been made that life actually allows for subduction zones to move easier. So uh, material that gets deposited in the subduction zone, it kind of, it works as a grease. grease. Yes, <laughs> kind of a grease. <laughs> so that may be one of the reasons why Earth is happily plate tectonic is that life took root here and it didn't on Venus. Hmm. Uh, those are some of the things that we we're still wrestling with. And one of the ways to get at this is actually looking at um, the carbon isotopes of, the, of Venus's atmosphere. If there was life at the surface at any point, and if it did sequester carbon in any real way, when you have these overturn events, it gets mixed back into the interior. It melts, and then it's re-released. So we should be able to see isotopic signatures. It's just whether or not we have the sensitivity to recognize them or even the understanding of what those will look like in a, a system that is CO2 dominated the way Venus is. Uh, so these are things that um, we are kind of like pushing the envelope for and trying to understand, uh, create context for observations we don't know we need yet. Yeah. Matt, what are you obsessed with right now? <laughs> well, that leads into it. <laughs> so uh, I'm, I'm actually obsessed with the... Um, likelihood for plate tectonics in the uh, universe. Uh, what are the fundamental controls that allow plate tectonics or disallow plate tectonics? Um, some of the early work I did, this project as well, really was looking at if you were in plate tectonics. Uh, if you were in this regime, how unstable or stable is it? Uh, but what I'm really interested in understanding is the feedbacks that reinforce or firmly destabilize. So surface temperatures play a big role in plate tectonics, uh, whether or not you have it. But the silicate weathering cycle also plays a role because the atmosphere actually is one of the chief controls uh, for these systems on whether or not you're going to be a happy planet like the Earth or maybe even Venus. So I'm interested in the, and I'm, I'm interested and uh, fascinated and obsessed with understanding how the interior and the atmospheres behave over geologic times together with and without life, uh, with different assumptions, different stellar neighborhoods. And the whole idea is to be able to understand whether or not plate tectonics is really going to be common. Uh, and if we can set up a predictive framework when we look at exoplanetary catalogs and say, well, we're pretty sure this planet has plate tectonics, it has the characteristics for what we understand work, but this planet doesn't. So we now have a framework to go and test. Uh, I might not see it in my lifetime, but these are things that can be generational. You know, they, they put the idea out there and they can be tested later and see if this body of knowledge holds up. Do you, do you think it would be like the plate tectonics finder? <laughs> would it would it be a mission that's very specialized at 
at, you know, with the right coronagraph and looking for these kinds of chemicals in the atmospheres? Or do you think it's like a more general purpose instrument that's going to have other jobs like the Habitable mm -hmm. Worlds Observatory? Uh, I think ultimately uh, the controls of plate tectonics and the signals of plate tectonics are much more general, that there aren't many yeah. telltale. So I think it has to be a jack of all trades. I think it has to take a hundred different um, observations and make inferences based on those observations, that there isn't going to be necessarily one smoking gun that we can detect from a distance, uh, unlike nitrogen, which might be this the smoking gun in our own solar system. No, oh, it's fascinating work. Matt, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with me today. And good luck with figuring out whether Venus had plate tectonics mm -hmm. early on. That's exciting. I'm going to talk some more about Venus and just like how exciting it is that we have an exoplanet analog right here in the solar system. But first, I'd like to thank our patrons. Thanks to David Richards, Mark Anstis, Antonio Lofilara, Dustin Cable, Vlad Shiblin, George, Andrew M. Gross, Jeremy Mattern, Josh Schultz, and Jordan Young, who support us at the Master of the Universe level, and all of our other supporters on Patreon. We think about Earth as this habitable world in an ocean of planets. Are we normal? Are we not normal? But we have just this incredible fortune of another planet that is exactly like Earth, Venus. It has the same mass as Earth. It has the same surface gravity as Earth. It's made of the same stuff. And yet we know that something went horribly wrong on that planet. So we have this comparison. We have two examples that we can then look out into the universe and say, is it more like Venus or is it more like Earth? And is it how much more like Venus is it and how much more like Earth is it and where did these processes diverge and that we can do all of these experiments and then use Venus as a control as we observe the atmosphere of a planet we can say oh does how does this compare to what we know about Venus our understanding of the cosmos would just not be the same if we didn't have Venus there and a lot of the initial exoplanets that we're going to be finding we will probably be finding these exo Venuses and we'll get a much better sense of figuring out when our two paths diverge. It seems just like such a gift from the universe. And so thank you universe for providing us with Venus and a place that we can study. And clearly we need to go back to Venus. We need to go into the atmosphere of Venus. We need to land on the surface. We need to retrieve a sample and bring it back home so we can understand that planet better. I've been pretty obsessed with Venus for the last year or so, and so I've got a lot of interviews about Venus, but two that I think you're really going to enjoy. One is with Dr. Paul Byrne, and he worked on the discovery of volcanoes recently on the surface of Venus. We thought Venus was mostly volcanically dead, and yet actually there could be active volcanoes still on the surface of Venus. My other conversation is with Dr. Michael Way, and we talk about the future exploration plans for Venus. What could be found there? Where should we be looking? And more thinking about how it is a similar, dissimilar exoplanet and how it compares to Earth. So two interesting interviews. I promise you're going to love both of them. So check one of those next. All right, we'll see you next time.